Good evening. Welcome to MS Stay at Home with Alvaro Fernandez in conjunction with the A Visiting School Melbourne. My name is Paul Low. I'm a senior lecturer in digital architecture design here at the Melbourne School of Design, University of Melbourne. I begin this evening's proceeding by acknowledging the traditional owner of the lands on which this event takes place here in Melbourne, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and to the traditional owner of the land, wherever you are. I pay my respects to the elders, family, past and present. So this is the sixth and the last of our public lecture events for the A Visiting School Melbourne. I'm co-hosting this event tonight with Mon Q, the director of A Visiting School Melbourne, and I'll invite Mon to introduce our speakers in a second. So the Melbourne School of Design has hosted the Architecture Associations for the last five years. Each year, we invited a group of AA tutors, both past and present, alumni and talented designer that is affiliated with the school to teach a two weeks intensive workshop here at the MSD. The visiting school provides an experimental platform in which staff and students can test emerging design methods, technology, techniques, and this year, we also extend this mentality towards a different way of teaching online. So bounded by our current COVID-19 lockdown this year, we run five units entirely online with all the tutors based in Europe and the UK. We have James Chung, a unit master of experimental unit six at AA, leading unit one. The unit attempt to ex survey the habits of domestic animal and question the essence of current state of domesticity. Unit two is led by Daniela Mitterberger and Tiziano Derma, exploring psychotropic typo topologies, looking at the behavioral interactions with our beloved computer screens. Unit three, led by Jessica Inn and Dennis Velker, explore unknown territories, a digital exploration of lands in dimensions not yet classified or established, the virtual environments. Unit four, led by Alison Crank, and Rafael Pananza looks at all the often encountered online lobby space, the waiting space that all our audience experience today before entering this webinar. Last, Unit 5 is led by Sergey May and Alvaro Fernandez, our speakers tonight. The unit titled Ghost Hardware explores spatial narrative to cinematic logic with a twist. Alvaro has taught at the visiting school in Mel Melbourne for the last three years and we explore where we explore the paradigm of the new paper. So early this week, Space Popular joined us to discuss freestyle and inclusions, inclusiveness of immersive internet. Yesterday, our conversation with Antoine Vesselio Autois, where he unpacked the panning culture of a digital habit. Tonight, we'll be going for a Google tour, Google map tour of the film set of upcoming feature film by Alvaro titled So Far the Sky to explore the complex relationship of image making in cinema constructed to the Western gaze. So following Alvaro's tour, we will have a Q&A session. So audience, if you have any questions for Alvaro, please use the Q&A functions on the bottom of your screens. And Mon and I will moderate the conversation, try our best to cover as my, any of the questions as we can. So Mon, over to you. Thanks, Paul. It always brings a smile to my face when I introduce Alvaro. As cheeky as Alvaro is in person, there is always a seriousness in the projects that Alvaro makes, an underlying truth that comes out in the presence or absence of bodies and spaces. I still recollect the criticality and the ability that Alvaro has to make the simple aspects of life captured in moments of beauty, suspended either in film or in writing. The anti-cliché, the anti-narrative, the subjectivity, and mystic filmmaker, Alvaro is in a constant flux of finding meaning and then breaking it in a journey that he himself is searching and living. A theorist and filmmaker, I would love to invite Alvaro to present the behind the scenes, cinema where images become weapons. Over to you, Alvaro. Thank you very much, Mon, for the kind words. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen as well. So let me do that. So hello, everyone, and thanks for, for being here, even though as bodiless energies. 
Um, I just want to talk a little bit of what I'm going to kind of go through or what I'm going to try to, um, to explain more or less or to show. So, I mean, as Mon said, uh, since I've graduated and I believe even before, I've been trying to seek for, uh, for a type of cinema that I can call my own, uh, for a type of gaze that can liberate me in a way from the slumbering dream of um, not only of the West itself, but of looking at things in order to gain something from them without being able to relate or to engage with them in a way where I don't need to extract anything from them, but there's a dialectical, a violent dialectical relationship between me and the object, the subject, and the subject and me. So that's why uh, when I kind of um, moved from from London to Colombia and Venezuela, in order to start researching a film that actually took me many years to be able to pull off, simply because of the huge level of complexity, the ever-changing political situation, and the shifting the shifting currents of contacts of people and of industry. So, I mean, the birth of the idea of the film, in a way, is born long, long ago, at least in its seed form. But uh, little by little, it started being shaped by several experiences that I had while living in those places and just spending day by day looking at how time passed. So I guess the seed might be Nostromo, uh, a uh, tale of the seaboard, like the masterpiece of uh, of Joseph Conrad, that in a way it's like a, a lucid telling of a story, which was thought impossible to tell, which is the the combos and impossible and irrational series of revolutions and counter revolutions that happen over a landscape, over a land, over a country of post colonial uh, nations in northern part of um, South America. So, I mean, this book basically is trying to uh, dissect socially, politically, and industrially the many kind of, um, the many layers that are left in that complex and revolutionary field 19th century that happens in South America. No? So certain aspects of that, uh, of that novel really caught my eye and really allowed me to express certain ideas that I previously really wanted to, to explore. My films mostly, overall, they are dealing with um, the notions of landlessness, the idea that the nation is the, or the motherland is the source of all vices, the idea that identity is not imposed, but is in a way created and forged by individual kind of uh, individual effort, and the idea that of what happens once the homeland dies, decomposes, or, or falls into a state of disrepair. And the individual or the citizen feels and is left orphaned over a land that doesn't give and offer refuge anymore. A father that becomes more like the Saturn in Goya's painting rather than like the protective father it is made, we are made to believe, no? So Venezuela, it's, uh, I don't know if you guys know much about Venezuela, but Venezuela is a super complex uh, country that you can see here on the map right here on the on the top of south america north of brazil it's a country like no other no um because after after the the liberation or the independence of south america by simon bolivar in the early 19th century uh venezuela kind of goes through a 19th century filled with um try, you know close to tribal wars by uh, the residue of the colonial kind of um, landlords or even warlords of each specific area. So the way of obtaining power of controlling the state was always through revolt, revolution, armed protest, and mostly kind of a uh, civil war. So through, those, through that crisis, the 20th century is born. Venezuela, a country that didn't know what it had under its, under its kind of lakes and under its, its mountains and under its forests, Basically, I mean, it can be summed up as the state in the world with the largest natural resources by far, no? Not only in gold and emeralds, not only in timber, but mostly in petrol. So Venezuela basically is the first petrol state in the world. Before Saudi Arabia, before Iran, before anything, it's the first petrol state 
of course, not counting the U.S., that you, you kind of encounter in, in South America or in, in a developing country. So from 1904, Venezuela is a place that starts kind of doing, going little steps towards kind of uh, industrial stability and towards kind of uh, the West being able to exploit its resources. So the area that we were like really focusing on was around the Lake Maracaibo area. In the Lake Maracaibo around the 19, 1914, they discovered the first huge prospect, colossal prospect of oil. Um, those prospects, all, all, of course, made the country really rich, but also in a way still unstable. So through the decades, the goal was to nationalize petrol and to be able to kind of um, keep it for the state. So I don't know if you guys know what is the OPEP, the Organization of Oil Producing Countries. The OPEP probably is the most important with the Cuban revolution and the Arab revolutions of Nasser in Egypt, is the most important blow to Western dominance, to Western industrial and economic dominance in the world. So the creation of the OPEP in the 60s and the oil, cri on the, and the, the oil crisis in the 70s, it's in a way what asserted the power, the industrial power of um, Venezuela and the oil producing countries. No? So it's the first major blow to the worst to the West dominance by far in the 20th century and probably kind of in, nearly in history, it feels. So, and this huge revolution is achieved thanks to Venezuelan minister of, of, um, of um, mines meeting with Saudi Arabia's minister of, um, for the royal family of, the, of the, the petrol industry in Saudi Arabia in Cairo, in, a, in the Hilton Hotel during 1959, anyhow. Venezuela basically is at the heart of the, this kind of industrial development and the revolution against the West in, that in the 70s and later in the 80s is going to really solidify. So it's a, for that, I'm trying to give that for a little bit of context of what it means. Venezuela is not another kind of unstable Latin American state in another cliche element of corruption and the cycles of corruption that never end. It's a hyper-industrialized country that in the 70s and 80s was like a really, really huge economy they had PDVSA in 76, that PDVSA is basically petroleum de Venezuela. So it means petroleum from Venezuela is the state, the state owned and um, petroleum company that after Aramco, Aramco basically, I don't know if you guys heard in the beginning of this year before the pandemic and the coronavirus and crisis, it, it, they, they were going to go on the market. It's basically the most profitable company in the world. Aramco by the Royal Saudi family, it's the company that after like the 70s also it got kind of taken over by the Saudi state from the Americans. And it's this, the, the company that kind of, uh, it's worth over three, a tri trillion dollars or something like that. So PDVSA was the second largest oil company in the world. Anyhow, decades passed and in, two, in 1998, Hugo Chavez wins the elections. Hugo Chavez uh, was this kind of larger than life political figure in Venezuela that in a way was trying to, uh, trying to go against the grain and really taking over like the, the whole kind of um, inequalities that uh, were really kind of scarring the Venezuelan society. Anyhow, from 2004, he did a purge on PDVSA oil company. So the whole company became an ideological instrument and tool of the state. So from there on, we start kind of a story. The, my interest in Venezuela was that from the recent decades, uh, and even really highlighting it in, in 2018 onwards, the state was suffering uh, from not only kind of uh, inflation of its kind of currency, but also through like a brooding possibility of a civil war that was growing within it. So my interest, starting from Nostromo, of course, like but adapting it into a 21st century kind of idea, was um, being able to capture um, the complex layers of a civil war that might start but might never kind of break out. So with a team of people from Bogota and Brazil, we started organizing the first trip that I'm going to briefly mention in order for later on to get into the other. So in that trip, we took it in November 2018, just like a few months before um, the really big xenophobia that attacks against Venezuelan migrants that were crossing the border in northern Brazil, southern Venezuela. So we go in. 
So basically, this is like a really complete isolated border that if you even see on this side, it really suffers from huge deforestation areas. And right here, there, there are also kind of huge illegal mining kind of uh, explorations by the rebel group ELN, which is the Liberation Army of Colombia that is based here. There are gold, huge gold mines that you can really not access because they are kind of uh, sites of extreme danger. No? <laughs> Let me put it that way. But this area um, is the most isolated border of Venezuela and the most isolated border in Brazil as well. And in this town between Pacaraima and Santa Elena de Urayem, we kind of um, set our gaze and, and went there basically with a flight that went from Bogota to Leticia, which is Leticia is the border town between Brazil and, and Venezuela in the Amazon. Then we took a plane from the sister city of, um, of, of Leticia to Manaus, the middle of the Amazon. And from Manaus, we went up to uh, Boavista. And from Boavista, we took a car, five, six hour drive up to Pacaraima. So in Pacaraima, we were set to do our first shooting of a film that takes place in many places and in many territories. It's a film which is a fractal film, a film that um, in order to, to kind of read through the situation, we chose to start portraying the limit and the frontier territories of a state that was in a way in its way from collapse. Civil war hadn't broken yet, or civil struggle hadn't have, broken hadn't broken yet by November 2018. But in January 2018, 18, they had these presidential elections that were apparently highly rigged by Maduro's government, which was the successor of Chavez. No? So the climate was a climate of revolution, a climate of complexity, a climate of violence, and a climate of confrontation. You need to know that by November 2018, the government in Brazil was Bolsonaro's government. That deal, they did the, the, after the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, um, the populist, the right, hyper right wing Bolsonaro won the government. So basically, I mean, this was the, the, the little town we, were, we, we started kind of living for three weeks in November 2018. And we were just trying to film the border. The border town is, is a space between. Uh, the Brazilian border and the Venezuelan border. A little tiny simple road which doesn't exist because it has no sovereignty. So it's a buffer zone like any other type of buffer zones. So a buffer zone between the militarized Brazilian part and the militarized Venezuelan part. There was like a silent tension. And through the night, basically, it's just migrants coming in, coming out. Migrants and migrants and migrants. So there was a United Nations kind of um, site over here trying to kind of receive all those thousands of migrants. So our idea was to shoot a, bit, a little bit the conditions that existed within that kind of uh, road. Further on, um, I'm going just to show some, maybe some photos that it's easier to understand. So here's where we are. And this is basically kind of a bit of the map of uh, the situation on the road, no? Like a buffer zone on blue, Brazilian on, on green, and Venezuelan sites and and military stations on yellow. Um, on this area that I'm going to try to, let's see if, if there's a possibility. Ah, yes, absolutely. Okay. So here's what you see. No? All those cars, what they are doing, it's waiting to even sometimes even go to get some petrol on the, on the petrol station by PDVSA because it's really, really cheap. Petrol in Venezuela has no price. It's a symbolic price. Most of the time it is closed, but there's a lot of kind of traffic and mostly human traffic in this road. On this side is the Brazilian side, the Brazilian side of the road. Those two flags of Venezuela and Brazil, they signal basically the, the frontier, this line signals the frontier. And long story short, what I wanted to tell about like actually the situation that happened here is that we were shooting, we were like just a, a team of four people trying to record with cameras a little bit the situation here, trying to create parallel scenes. One of the scenes we created was with a mariachi band that I met eat while eating in a rodicio. And this mariachi band used to come every day from Venezuela to Brazil because the Venezuelan Bolivar was so, so worthless. It was like worth like not even a penny of a dollar. So they had to earn money somehow. So they used to go back to the Brazilian town to get some money. And later on, in order to come back to Santa Elena, they had to wait for a car to pick them up or for a truck to pick them up. So they used to sing in the middle of the road love songs that cars used to stop stop by in order to film them through whatsapp to send their lovers or um 
our wives uh, like a, a song dedicated to them, a mariachi song and uh, dedicated to them. So we started making a scene with them. We only shot during the magic hour. So we only shot when the light was kind of low. Um, so we developed that scene with the mariachi band, trying to kind of wait for in the road for like someone to pick them up and also getting some money from, uh, from drivers um, trying to kind of, um, you know, fall in love with their wives or something. So then we went with them through the night. Other scene was with money merchants. So you had like Venezuelan money merchants in the middle of the road that um, those guys basically um, were trying to exchange worthless believers for reals. So in order to get some money, this is like highly illegal, of course. So they had to do it in specific areas in the middle of the frontier, kind of hidden a little bit in the middle of the frontier. So around these kind of areas behind bushes and everything. So cars used to stop around those kind of areas to find it. Because then when you went forward, you had the Brazilian side. So it used to be a neutral zone, a no man's land where no one kind of messed with you. So more or less, this is kind of the, the whole Venezuelan side with Pedevesa, and this was the Brazilian side of the road. So one thing happened one day that the, the sound team was recording some um, kind of extra sounds of the, of the whole thing with voices of people talking that from this area, this little thing, it looks like nothing, right? But actually, it was like some headquarters from like some Venezuelan military with a lieutenant in here. Okay, in these headquarters at night, you had Venezuelan kind of prostitutes that during the, during the day, they used to sell coffee to, uh, to drivers. But during the night, they used to be prostitutes right on here. And they used to kind of prostitute themselves to the Venezuelan officers. So this quarter, I mean, this kind of um, those barracks, they were uh, like a funny and really kind of sinister part of the of the border because they used to bring the girls here and they had some rooms and they they had kind of relationships with them. So um, they were recording sounds on 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 this side of the road. My my team, which was Fernanda and Tiago, two Brazilian citizens. And they got like called by uh, some Venezuelan military kind of um, personnel to say, what are you doing? Why do you have these tools? Because they, get, they were also all paranoid that something might happen because recently after I later, later heard, some drones were flying across that area in order to monitor Venezuelans. You know, maybe true, maybe not true, who knows? So they took them, they abused them, they arrested them, and they arrested them in this side. So we had me and my DOP that were shooting kind of some kind of extra scenes in the Venezuelan border. We're like looking for them during the night. Where are they? Where are they? Because they weren't answering their phone calls. And we had kind of arranged meeting in a specific area of the border. So at the end, like we were driving through here and I saw their silhouettes over there. So I told my DOP, okay, Mauro, you go to the, I need to, I, I'm going to go myself in order to see what happens, but you have to go to the, to, the, to our house, leave the cameras, leave all the material, and bring the passport. So I kind of showed myself in, and uh, they arrested me as well. So they put my, the handcuffs on me, and I was the leader of, the, of this whole complot and this whole kind of espionage uh, act. And we had to wait. This a thing happens that I will also explain later of what happens in, um, in another areas, more violent areas than this one, in a more violent period. But it's classic snowball effect where bureaucracy it's as if you guys drop your pen, you, do, you drop your pen on the ground. So on the ground, you can you don't know what, what, I mean, you cannot get your pen. You cannot actually kind of just, just get your pen from the ground because it's impossible. So you have to call your, your father or, or like yeah, your boyfriend. And your boyfriend has to call the mayor of the town. The mayor of the town has to call the president and the president has to call. So it is, it's a snowball effect where a little kind of a, a snowflake transforms into a whole ball. So we had to wait for the major of the military base on the other side of the border, far like 40 minutes away from us to come here in order to kind of interrogate us and to see what happened. So after five hours waiting, they came in, the military came in, the GMB is called, the Guardia Nacional Bolivariana. They came in with trucks, with guns, with AK-47s, all of them, to pick us up and take us because we, I, we thought, okay, we're going to be fine. And we did nothing. We're like next to it. We have our passport. When the, when Mauricio, the DOP came, I gave him like, because he wasn't arrested, he was able to escape. I gave him a handshake through the gate, through this gate. I gave him um, 
the the sound cards from the sound team. So they didn't have kind of um, any evidence. What happened later on is that that major came and he was unsure. So he, they take they take us to Escamoto military base to be arrested and put in jail. And now I'm going to show you a little bit. So during the night, they drive, uh, wait a sorry guys, I'm trying to, there we go. So they drove, they drove us on the night, we passed illegally the Venezuelan frontier, and we drove up to the Scamoto military base. Here, they took us our phones, we did like a, we did 24 hours of interrogation and um, with interrogation and basically kind of, uh, they checked our phones and everything on this barrack over here. And then they took us to the jail right here. So on the jail, we basically just took it to sleep and like they were taking us individually in order to kind of check if our stories were right. Long story short is that news channels kind of noticed so we, we ended up being on the news in Brazil and all Latin America and in Spain. Um, journalists or filmmakers got arrested da, 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 so the whole deal kind of a little broke loose during the night they were going to send us and take us to the airport which was like right here right in front of us and take us to caracas in order to get to trial this is the classic and um, threat they give you know at the end of the day like after after like 30 hours of arrest we were like um put i mean taken out of the military base like freed and everything kind of ended up being a big scare. But anyhow, I'm just telling that story um, to kind of realize what, what an image can do and also what being caught in a specific situation, like out of hand, uh, completely out of place, it can result into really bad situations because that's when we realized that this film was not going to be an easy film to make and was not going to be just a simple kind of adventure to take. It was going to be a film we, we had to commit and we had to understand the danger we are at and what every single frame we were shooting meant. So that in a way really transformed the gaze we had towards the context we were looking at. It transformed a little bit the idea of the film I had and the possibilities this film also had in order to be made. So fast forward to next year, September and October 2019. So next step, um, and another really important step, which we had been working for a year and a half on the possibility of doing, was shooting in the Petro city of Maracaibo. Maracaibo is basically kind of um, the state of Mar the state of Zulia and Falcon. Those two states are the states where all the in industrial and refining technology is at. All the refineries are basically um, what Venezuela is really trying to take care of because if they take that away from them the whole country stops they are the strategic areas next to colombia their main enemy the strategic areas that they are trying to militarize they're trying to really take care of but at the same time is where the whole story is that this is like a map of maracaibo and cabima and the little dots you might see here are basically just thousands and thousands of oil wells in the middle of lake maracaibo lake maracaibo so you guys understand it's basically where the largest oil reserves in the world are at. So um, you have nearly 300,000 million barrels under this lake, more than Saudi Arabia, more than Iraq, more than anything else in the world. And the largest OPEP refinery complexes are right there, basically on the, those kind of areas. So it's a huge industrial triangle that they are protecting at all costs. But because of the civil war that started in January 2019, the civil struggle and the coup d'etat, the coup that started with Juan Guaido, the whole thing broke loose. So in that era was the worst era of the, of the embargo imposed by the U.S. allied countries and the U.S. and Southern Command and Navy forces. So no, water, no, no food was coming in, only contraband. No, uh, no petrol was being able to be sold. And also, really important, no dilutant. So they couldn't really refine petrol. So the whole city had no petrol whatsoever. So 
So the whole city was under like a state of complete and total collapse. So it really took us um, one year of planning this, trying to kind of um, produce it and go through many plans of how can we access not only the city, but how can we send and pass through the border or through the airport or through whatever our um, cameras, sound equipment, technical equipment, everything. So we ended up with two, um, with two strategies. The two strategy was the first one, I was the one going to fly by plane through Panama because Panama doesn't fly directly to Caracas. If I flew to the Maiketi airport in Caracas, I was going to be arrested. I had like a, already kind of a, a record on the line because of the rest of the previous year. So I couldn't kind of risk going to Caracas and then flying to Marrakech, the airport of Maracay. So what I did was flying through Panama directly to Maracaibo, the only, the only flight that you had direct to the Maracaibo airport. The Maracaibo airport, I arrived, and basically the production team from Caracas that they had been doing pre-production all over this lake, all over this site, and all over this city, you know, to those areas, those areas really, they picked me up. Those guys, they've been kind of trying to get into contact with a lot of kind of elements, with a lot of belligerent kind of, um, parties in the in the political kind of sphere of Maracaibo because you had a lot of power between the the GMB, the, the national the Bolivarian National Guard, and also the Secret Service. So in a way we had to kind of they had to negotiate with them, but it was it's impossible to negotiate really. So it was all a surprise at the end. So from the, the other team, the other like three four members of the Colombian team, they had to come and bring all the rest of the equipment through Maicao. Maicao is like a crazy frontier town that looks like like Damascus, basically. It's like uh, full of mosques and everything because it's like a Lebanese enclave. And they had to come from Maicao, get a taxi, and go to Paraguachón. Paraguachón is the border town of um, the border town of the, the border that you find in the Guajira, between Guajira and between Venezuela, between Colombia and Venezuela. I don't know if I can go much further than this because I think it has like already kind of uh, anyhow, like you see, it's uh, it's kind of a strange, it's kind of a strange place. Let's say that. But in this place, I mean, there's the border. In the border, when I was living in the in the in the in the Wajira before. I befriended um, a series of people on the border, on the on the kind of border that are basically kind of dealing with the smuggling of goods from um, from Colombia to Venezuela, no? And these guys that were kind of legal, they work with Colombian migration, but they were friends with the Venezuelan migration officers. So we ended up putting all the sound equipment and all the camera equipment inside of um, petrol tanks, inside of many little places that were hidden. So in order for us to pass it through the border and bring it to the city of Maracaibo, because otherwise it was impossible to be able to kind of bring all the equipment into the city and be able to use it. However, that very day, the only thing I had with me was, was my camera and a tripod that I had brought um, on the plane. And we were shooting, me with the production team, we were just shooting on this place, which basically kind of uh, is the other, the oriental part of the lake. And there's like a petrochemical refinery. So we were shooting just the, a flame from the petrochemical refinery for the film. However, we didn't know, and that was a production, the only production's fault. We didn't know that um, over this kind of refinery, over this area, it was like a sicariato is called. So it's like a place where hitmen, like hitmen and assassins bands and, and, and kind of mafias, I said, because right now in order to kill a person in Venezuela, it was to be really, really cheap. For less than a hundred and hundred and fifty dollars, you can order a hit on someone. So we were shooting that and we didn't really know what was happening. So, okay, we were fine. We were shooting and you know, nothing, nothing happens. Everything is fine. What happens again was the classic snowball effect, but this time was the worst small snowball effect ever, basically. So we were shooting the flame of the refinery. Refineries are key enclaves of military power. So as you know, this is kind of some, some uh, shots of the film. So as you know, um, 
um, they protect really, really well this kind of technology. And every single kind of um, stranger or person that is holding a camera is taking accountable on charges of espionage because a camera is much worse for the narrative of the state, much worse than a, an, AK, an AK-47. So the image is truly a weapon. And it's not only a weapon, but it's weaponized by the context and by the situation you are given in order to be able to, to, uh, to capture an image. So what happened really was that the security of the refinery came in. Later on, um, the, how do you call it? The, the National Guard came in and little by little, we got arrested into a, a, a little kind of um, cell in the refinery. But at the end, we were. We thought everything was fine. Everything was doing everything. By the way, twelve people plus the the chief police, the chief officer of the Sevin came in. So, so you understand, the Sevin is the secret, the Bolivarian secret service. They were trained by the CIPOL. The CIPOL is the Cuban secret service, probably the best secret service in the world. The Cuban secret service at the same time was trained by the KGB. So all the torture and the interrog interrogation method in order to create psycho terror in order to for you to feel helpless, they were trained in a way by really kind of specific guys. So for context, those are the guys that torture right now, okay? So those are the guys that take you and they can do anything to you because they don't really need to answer to anyone but presidency. So we were feeling completely helpless. So imagine 12 people wearing black masks, dark skull masks, um, with AK-47, completely wearing black, come 12 people. And behind them, in the door, you see a guy, a two meter tall guy, Stand with a with a silk um, with a silky um, pink shirt, jeans and Valentino shoes, gold watch, gold Rolex, emerald um, rings, and a golden chain. He comes in, and he basically, just long story short, around nearly ten hours of interrogation, 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 um, with me. So at the end of the day, they, they ended up, okay, we were going to go to Caracas again. That was the threat, the classical threat. I was already completely helpless. They took us by car to the city of Maracaibo to check and, and, and look in our hotel if we had something, um, something in our hotel. So they took us over here. This was our, like, where we were staying, our headquarters. And they checked all our hotel. Uh, nothing really happened, but in the middle of the, in the middle of the way from the other side of the lake to the side of the lake, they had stopped in the middle of an empty field, shine bright light at us, made us kind of um, leave the, the room, the, 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 the car. We were all kind of, um, with the, with the cuffs on and, uh, we were thinking they were going to basically shot us, but at the end they were just taking photos with like big, big flashes in order to kind of, um, document the whole thing. And took us back to the car. The, the, the guys that took us into the place was like a convoy of several cars, but the guys that went, that were with me in the same car was like a guy, a complete frivolous guy, and a woman, which there was a classic Latina woman with long straight hair and thick body, but she had an AK-47 and her nails were long green painted nails, dark green painted nails, and she was like hitting the trigger with the nails, making the little sound of tick, 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 tick all the way on the road until reaching the hotel. Thanks to all in the hotel, the Colombian guys that were coming that day, the production team was smart enough to, to take them out of the room and, and leave, um, take them to another apartment we had close by. So they took all the computers and all the hard drives. So they found nothing. And at the end, they just took a, a video of me recording. I, Alvaro Fernandez from, from Spanish cities and that guarantee that they have not broken my human rights. So, um, in a way that was like long story short, like the big, big scare that we, we really had. So I'm just going to show you some images to, to end in the last kind of five, 10 minutes. So for example, that day I was like so scared, of course, that we had to rethink and reframe our whole production strategy. We had, we had bought this white car that we were like shooting with. We had all this equipment on it, like lighting, a car grid, the camera a big thing we had to shoot, driving through Maracaibo, driving through certain things. We had to contract a new kind of um, production, more mafia-like production uh, side boss 
that could deal with policemen. So there are policemen that were on our payroll, basically. So we had all of them paid. They were out of security in order for this car to be kind of uh, escorted. But the first day we had to change the actor because apparently the actor knew how to drive, but he didn't know how to drive this car. So we had a crazy car crash where we destroyed the, the back of this Toyota Yaris car. So we had to repair two cars. Money, money, money. We had no money. Food was scarce. So we had no water, no food, no electricity. There were no electricity because there were electricity shortages. This was the production phenol, the production mafia guy that then he became the main actor in the film as well. So in the road, there were like people blocking the road constantly. And it was really impossible to kind of get through. No petrol stations. We had no petrol because four days of queue in order to kind of refill with 30 liters of petrol. So we had no possibility of doing that. So we had to buy illegal petrol in illegal areas. This was the, like a prop we had, which is a baby we threw from a bridge. Sound recording. This guy was like another guy from Maracaibo from previous, a previous contact that ended up trying to kidnap me. Um, and this was the massive bridge of Maracaibo where like a main, a key thing took place. And it was really hard because the, the National Guard really, this was like a strategic location for the, for the military. So we had to really deal with that. He was, cinema, he was cinematographer Mauricio Reyes and we were in the lake here in Cabimas. This was Pedro, another kind of fisherman that ended up being a little bit of an actor as well in the Cabimas place. So these were like our hands, the hands of a sailor, of a, of a fisherman, sorry full with petrol and they were like fishing prawns in the middle of the lake that they're only source of income. So it was really impossible. There were a lot of oil spills because that, those were our, our feet after every day of shooting in the lake filled with tr crude oil because crude oil was over everything. I mean, you couldn't imagine. Everything was full of like oil spills. Here was like a shooting of uh, like a scene that we were trying to shoot in the middle of the lake with, with the guys in the team and with uh, Pedro. Then this was like the big refinery up north in Punto Fijo, Amuay, which is, so you get like a little bit of a context. Right north, eight hours that we got another, another arrest right here. And we shot this refinery, the Amuay, which is the largest refinery complex in the world, basically. And it's huge, like the flame was lighting up this little town. So we ended up really hiding up in this little town. This is a little fish, fisherman's village. And we were hiding, and you cannot see it properly, but this was like a, a ruin kind of structure, a ruin. So we were hiding behind the ruin because it was super impossible for us to film that because we were being observed by the military and by drones and by everything. So we were so paranoid. So that night I slept with a rosary on my chest in order to be able to sleep. So, so yeah, and this was a massive 30 meter flame of them where it looked like Blade Runner. It, it, like basically looking at Luxor in Egypt, it's one of the most beautiful sites I've ever seen. Those huge colossal refineries that are at, at 15%. And then the other shoot that I don't really have time to go through it was here in the Wahira Desert, no? And that was the gun I had. But I think, um, I don't know if I have, I have time to go through more, but um, like summarizing a little bit what I wanted to kind of express or tell you guys a little bit, um, I'm going to leave this running as well. It's the, I mean, even the idea of um, making this film, it really became more than a simple uh, kind of script and effort, more than simply writing a narrative. It became a way of reacting against logistical impossibilities that were presented in front of us. And the whole film, of course, we wanted to treat and portray the idea of a state that was um, neglecting its children, yes. But at the same time, about a specific pirate type of character that was taking advantage of these specific conditions of landlessness in order to kind of grow and develop a new sense of identity that was not without it himself, but was within himself. So the, the, the film is like populated by pirates, by, um, by this type of characters, several type of characters, that in a way they, they either survive or profit. So all the characters that you see through the film, they are either pirates or pilgrims that live within the context of a decaying or collapsing state, which is Venezuela in the 21st century. So uh, we finished the shooting the film in the island of Curaçao, in this island, and the, 20th, uh, the 20th of January, 2020, after one year and a half of shooting, 
We also shot in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean with the Colombian Army, with a naval vessel from the, from the Colombian Southern Command Forces, uh, ally of the US. So um, I'm just going to leave um, playing this while we are talking. And those are just screenshots of, sorry, they're really highly contrasted. I don't know why, but they are like screenshots of certain scenes that we had in the film. Thank you, guys, for listening. Thank you, Alvaro. That's a um, very interesting, almost awful ethnographic way of um, narrating behind the scenes of, of, a, of a film. Um, Alvaro, I, I mean, I, I've seen your film before. I mean, it's, quite, uh, it's, it's always very super dark. I mean, we can talk about the atmospheres later on, but um, I'm almost interested in... It's interesting as a comment that um, your presentation format today, where you take us through the behind the scene, almost as if there's a second, we almost didn't talk about what the narrative of the film is. Yeah. In fact, I almost doesn't, for one moment, I feel like you are narrating the movie, but the film, but at the same time, I realize it's actually also very real. So there is this kind of, uh, um, I, I, I guess my question is in how far some of this experience is sort of very, like this fearful experience, this sort of anxiety that you experience on ground is sometimes it's also been brought into the film itself because I saw your film last year when you were here with the, at the visiting school and there is a kind of, a, I think you call it baroqueness in, in your movie. Um, maybe you want to expand it a little bit. Yeah, um, I mean, from the lecture, I really wanted to um, just tell you a little bit the, the war, the battle, the battle stories and the war little stories about um, the behind the scenes or shooting that, I mean, at least some of them. But um, the film itself, uh, I mean, it's narrative, it's really fairly simple. I mean, I could, I could explain it easily. But um, the, the style of the film, I guess, the, the approach of the film and the, the way we relate to, um, to subjects and to people it's true I really kind of, it's really intimately because we choose specific lenses in order to portray this kind of complexity and this type of uh, a series of intensities and in, impossible to domesticate or to reduce subjects and characters that are wild and unruly in its own kind of dignity. Um, so I think for me, Baroque is a really useful way of thinking about fragmenting bodies, about stretching them, about um, creating a specific points of view where the, where the body itself is not living within basically the frame, it's trying to stretch for something else. So if you see maybe on the frames, the type of, the type of lower angles, the type of diagonals we were trying to kind of portray, were really inspired of Baroque sculpture and a lot of Caravaggio, of course, no? But, um, but even beyond Caravaggio, a lot of Michelangelo too, eh? the way Michelangelo's muscles kind of stretch out of the scene, and even from his like um, cultural sketches that he used to do no? with wax, and that I was really trying to base myself. And then taking it to the 20th century with um, Sergei Rubsevsky cinematography from the Soviet Russia um, expressionist, constructivist, post-constructivist kind of epoch in cinema. And we were really trying to take on board because we wanted to be a film really based on I am Cuba, cinematographical approach, which was like a camera that he called emotional camera, emotional cinematography, which the camera could at the same time portray emotion and, and kind of and represent it. So in a really interesting way. So our subject, subjects, we really kind of relate to them in a really close and, um, and in an even vulnerable way because we become vulnerable with them as well, I think. Can I ask, is that, because, is that also why you mentioned that you only always shoot at low light? Is to get that effect, yeah, we, that sort of baroque We wanted effect? to get, mm, that wasn't because of the effect, particularly Paul, it's not particularly because it looks beautiful or not. It's because we wanted time to not pass. We wanted to create the idea of a suspense or a timelessness because this whole situation in Venezuela is also as if it's kind of suspended in time. It's as if nothing happens and everything happens at the same time. So when there's no, Sun, there's no time. Sun for me is what marks the, the, the passing of time. And the idea of this kind of shadowlessness, the idea of there's no shadow, there's no passing of the, of the, of the clock of time, it's an idea that I think we wanted to really explore, the idea of limbo. So the, the whole film, you're in a limbo. So everything is shot in exteriors, but everything is shot during the magic hour. So we had 15 minutes per magic hour. So it was insane. So we only have 30 minutes a day to shoot in areas that it takes 
so so much time to be able to enter and they're so expensive to be able to access them so it was like suicidal effect like we had to be really really we had to practice the whole day it was everything is choreographed when you see it live you think oh man this is like oh this is documentary but it's not everything is choreographed the conversations were orchestrated everything is kind of a it's for me it's a fiction even though of course we had to sell it as a documentary you know but but yeah it became really something really hard to shoot basically Alvaro, just for those people who are here that haven't seen your film, um, is there a place for them to watch it? Or, you know, is there an area, you know, where they can find it? So maybe they could actually see the behind the scenes and actually put pinpoint one of those places that you actually say. Yeah, yeah I mean, this film, um, we're in the process after eight months. Um, we've been editing for the last eight months since I came back from Curaçao to, to Berlin and London. But... Um, we plan to have it the editing to find the final cut at least after the 18th of august so after okay. like an eight month editing period and then we have the stage of um, sound design that sound design takes place in colombia and in london mostly with a team of five people and then color grading so we are hoping at least to have the film by december this year so the, the premiere to be 2021 so the first, I mean, these films, you really see them in festivals and then, of course, movie or, uh, or like several platforms, kind of my Nocturno, for example, my previous film was in movie. Uh, and so maybe they show it again some other time and that's when people can really mm. see them. But if someone is really interested about seeing previous films, of course, I can send links. I mean, it's like a really mm -hmm. democratic kind of thing, no? Sure. But, um, but um, this film is not ready yet, of course. Okay. Um, I think like stuck behind the screen and like, you know, mm -hmm. us being all here throughout the different lectures, I, I, I was very interested in that journey that you took us on with this, you know, policy, political, cultural, social implications on really our reliance on petroleum. You know, we, we, we sit in our comfortable chairs built from these petrol materials you know like, yeah. like we live in these cities where the tarmacs that we actually drive on are actually because of these places as well and these i guess it's quite nice for you to collapse that space for us you know take us to yeah. these spaces where actually they are the end parts of where our stuff is made you know and that we in these mega cities that we sit comfortably in is also these complicated networks and landscapes that actually in this sort of reality that we're living is all one, right? So I think for, for me, it's, it's such an interesting journey where you sort of weave in and out from map into the Google Earth and we're in a time where we can actually do this, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think to rewind a little bit in terms of your journey as a filmmaker, you know, your background as a filmmaker is very different from, you know, traditional filmmakers, right? They're, they're, you're not trained mm -hmm. in a formal way, you know, under apprentice of a filmmaker where you follow, you come from a very image, you know, way of like understanding spatial qualities. And could you tell us a little bit about the process that you've gone to and why you've chosen film as a medium? to express your ideas and also maybe there's more agency in what you do rather than let's say another building. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, totally. For me, it was like, I, I mean, so you understand, I mean, I've been always doing film since I was really little um, because my, my family from my, my uncle and my cousin, they were like um, cinematographers and, and they did like commercial stuff, small stuff, but at the same time, cameras were always around, around me, you know? So, um, I, I was always doing that. I was always doing that. In a way, for me, I always tell the, the guys that shooting skate films and filming skateboarding was a great way of learning about being resource, resourceful and doing a lot with a little. But in terms of the architectural education, even when I was in Perth at Curtin, I really found today, I already had kind of a deep, deep interest on the cinematic possibilities of not only the space itself, but on how space becomes activated through, through inhabitation and movement. Um, and then I guess in the A, it was in intermediate three, uh, in, in third year, when I kind of really liberated myself from, from the notion of form and for the notion of gravity more than anything. And that was when I was in Seville that, that summer previously starting that year. 
I was researching about uh, the conquistadors' letters to um, to Spanish or whatever while they were going crazy in the Amazon. So that when while they were going completely um, driven by fever dreams in those Amazon journeys, no, that they were completely going crazy. And I found this letter by this guy, which was an Irish prisoner in a in a prison in Manaus in the, in 1622 and called Gaspar Chillán el Irlandés. So probably in English, his name was Jasper Dillon. Um, so the guy was writing outlandish perceptions of space with a grammar and a specific type of language, which was human, but at the same time, its syntax and the way the wording was in a way linked was absolutely, uh, was like reading James Joyce, no? It was like reading Ulysses by James Joyce. I felt that I needed to free my, in order to go forward into this fever dream of life itself or of situations that don't allow you to completely grab them by the hand and formalize them, to, uh, that they are liquid, that they are never, they're always shifting in form, always sh shifting in attitude, that are unruly and, and wild. They're savage in its most pure and beautiful sense of the world. I needed another type of language. Uh, I needed something that, uh, that allowed me more movement, more kind of, um, more, more poetry, a level of poetry, which was kind of um, not casting a stone, but cast through light. And through images and films, I mean, I, I, mean, I used, I always being a cinephile, I watch a lot of films. And the more you grow up, the, the, the more films you watch and the harder films you watch. And you start realizing, is this possible? It's like the first time I watched Films such as Koyanit Saski with 17 years old in Australia or Apocalypse Now in Australia as well I watched. When I first watched that, I was like, is this possible? I mean, can a person actually do this? And for me, this idea that I could transmit something impossible through, through an element which is just a window of projected light, I felt in love with that. And I took, let's say, the architectural intelligence of being able to understand the space as not only something without the subject, but something is that the subject itself, the way the subject inhabits its own speciality, speciality, you know, as something much more formless, as something that is actually being contradicted, that has point of view. I felt the language itself was being beneficial for my type of uh, thinking, more than just um, volumes and, and, and forms that had to be subjected to gravity or to a specific visualization, you no? Know? And I became more elaborate with time. It's about working. I mean, anything is about practice. If you don't practice, you're not going to get good at anything. Film, no one really taught me this, this, and that. Why? Well, I read books. I watched a lot of lectures. I talked to the right people. And a lot of filmmakers come from architecture. A lot of filmmakers come from law. The best filmmakers I've ever met, no one studied in film school. So I don't think architecture, in any degree you do, you don't allow them to tell you what you can do and what you can't do. Of course, it's harder because you don't have the contact. So in a pragmatic level, yes, you don't have the contact. You don't have the contact in order to get into film festivals. So you need to develop them. Okay. But if you want it hard enough, it might happen. It really might happen because you get good, but you need to be critical with yourself as well. So. That's interesting, Avro, uh, because it's what we were discussing yesterday with Antoine as well about applying the discipline to a multidiscipline or a different discipline of practice. Um, Donald Bates has the questions here. He says, could you speak a little yeah. bit more about the choreography of the spontaneous? So this is the early on when we talk about how you were describing that some, um, some of the scene has to be choreographed or highly choreographed. Yeah. So the question is, is it just for necessity or perhaps not, or it's a condition of the immediacy of the film, always being constructed as an experience, and perhaps uh, the means justified or pro produce the end, in order to produce the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to even like have the, have the I, I cannot see it, okay. No, but I, about the choreography itself, I mean, uh, I try to follow, I, I've invented myself this kind of uh, weird methodology, where I need, in order to um, to really understand a place, I need to disarm myself fully. So I always go to a place doing these maps. No, I do these maps. I, oh, wow, I understand everything. You know, I can see everything from the top. It's like Google Earth. Okay, going, living here, no problem. I mean, I can live here a thousand years. Uh, look, it looks so okay, like a picturesque desert. Then I end up going there and 
I ended up getting, get, I got trapped in a way. I was in a, for example, when I, I, I live here for three months, here for three months, but there's nothing. So all the ideas and all the, the preconceptions I had of the place and of what I was going to do, I want to do a great film, I want to do the best film in the world, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Everything falls apart, everything, all that I think and all that I mean means absolutely nothing. Uh, I feel completely disarmed, I feel completely helpless. So I restart again, I rewrite everything from point zero. So I befriended a, a certain people that become, became my friends and I was hanging out with them every day without expectations, without anything. So basically when I was, when I was there, I was spending every day, every morning at nine o'clock, Gustavo, my friend used to pick me up in his car. I had to fill them with petrol because I was the guy that was buying them petrol. No? And we used to go driving, we were drinking whiskey from 10 o'clock in the morning. We were drinking whiskey, getting drunk all day and spending all day in this place. This place is a, is a contraband, a clandestine contraband yard. That I like how pixelated it is because you see, this is the way you see Google Earth, a pixelated blob, no? That I didn't. But we entered through here and we were sitting on this little place all day drinking whiskey, drinking polar beer, contraband beer, and talking about the classic things. What do you talk about? Women, banalities, music, uh, things like that. And at night, we were like basically just doing uh, gasoline smuggling. Um, trucks from Venezuela used to come in. We were unloading the trucks. They were orchestrating the kids. So in a way, I started creating, I started, I started placing myself within the context. So I existed within the context. I, I became, I was like a stranger, but they called me a specific. I was, I was a known guy. So I talked about my life. I became, of course, I mean, this, it's not an equal relationship. I mean, it would be really kind of hypocritical to say that, but it's a relationship that you develop and you talk and they know you. So at the end of the day, in order to orchestrate or choreograph what you later write, you learn by how they move. You understand how the dynamics work. Who goes first? Okay, first they do this. They put the barrels here, then they do that and that and that. You research a little bit about the dynamics of the space itself or the dynamics of the business and the logistics of the business. I know this person does that. I know them all by name. So you need to know everyone by name because if you call them by your name, there's a specific type of thing. You tell them, about, you ask them about, about stuff. I mean, you talk casually. So I was three months right here researching for three months, just spending every day here under the sun. And what I mean by choreographing a scene such as uh, these, those things, okay? Like they are just uh, unloading like thousands of liters of petrol onto Pimpinas in order to be sold all over the Caribbean. So um, the thing I just did was um, I always have like a, a catalyst within the scene. So the catalyst itself, it's like a person that I'm closer to that I tell them, okay, junior or whatever move this way, try to push your, your mate in a specific way, try to kind of and talk about specific key things. Okay, talk about Maduro's um, policy, about petrol that he, he did to yesterday, because I was researching every night. Every night I was researching about what, what was going on and I was rewriting the script of the day. So I was erasing everything I had written and rewriting the script of the day. So every day was a new day. And because shooting for us, it, it's because we don't have money, and we had to do it fast. So we had to be super effective. So I had to know exactly what I want, but at the same time, I need to know how to react to everything that happens within the place. So I need to know how to improvise really well. So to, your, to answer your question, Donald, um, the orchestration becomes like a way of infiltrating certain uh, belligerent or, or radical elements within the scene that they're going, um, they going to kind of glue it together. They're going to be able to direct it from my direction, they're going to be directing themselves their direction. Or even this scene, for example. This scene, this is Alex, which is the owner of the yard, but then later we had a fall off, no? Because he, yeah, he was like extorting me, basically. So he was really drunk. So to win the, we had this scene planned for weeks, okay? It was going to be a, they were going to have turtle for breakfast because they have this really endangered turtle for breakfast, really crazy thing. It looks like as if they're eating like, take away food that is turtle. And they just talk after finishing um, the, all the, the unloading of the, of the oil. So what really happened was that the day before, they and some, some guy in the town slashed his brother with a knife. So what happens uh, in these kind of towns with these indigenous communities um, or post-indigenous communities is that they have a code of their own, no? So they have a law of their own. So, um, Long story short, he had to go. His family had to go into war with the other guy's family. 
So the guy came in that night with a lot of guns and a lot of whiskey. So he was so, so, so drunk that he couldn't stand up, basically. So we had to sit them in this kind of place. And this was kind of an improvisation we had to do in order to make something happen. Otherwise, the whole thing was going to be destroyed. And that same day, he was like, okay, Albert, you need to pay me this amount of money because I was an easy scapegoat. I was an easy target for him to finance his war. So we had to sell a car, find that money for the car, anyway. So we had to adapt to all those things. And the scenes and the whole ambience of the film is born out of those clashes. It's not a script itself, but the script is born orchestrating and directing the scene. I have a question here from Christopher. He says, um, if the camera is a weapon, what is your shield? Do you have specific tactic positions or relationships that you empl employ to defend your position and maintain your project when under threat from the authority? Yeah. I, ha I have a funny story about that. Um, when we were arrested and we, when we went to Venezuela, because we planned that for a year and a half to, to enter Maracaibo, to enter Venezuela in the, that state of embargo and of war. What did we do? You know, to plan everything out and something that could really save our asses, basically. We had to create a parallel project on the side. So we could, the, the film back then, the title of the film was Introduction to Civil War. So imagine that. If we go with that, no, impossible. So we had to create a parallel kind of project that was, okay, with the production company of Caracas, they signed an, uh, like a, a, an official letter for, with, their, with their kind of stamp and everything saying, okay, we were doing, officially we were doing a scouting for a feature film directed by me, a Spanish person, um, that was a reinterpretation or readaptation of Don Quixote, but instead of going crazy with books, he went crazy with the internet, and instead of seeing windmills as giants, and they were refineries being kind of a knights of a shining armor. So we had to completely twist the whole narrative and we had to have a backup plan in order for us to be kind of protected in case something happened. Another backup plan I had was in case, in case everything goes astray and in case they send us to Caracas to be, trial, to be put in trial, I have to have political connections. So you need to have uh, always an ace under your sleeve, uh, always. Uh, and sometimes that's not enough because it's so in unpredictable. The thing is that uh, there are so many angles to power that sometimes you get lost into it. So they, like for example, what happened to us on that bridge, the bridge that I, that I showed um, when I was here, on that bridge basically, um, the issue was that the, the military guards on one side didn't really communicate to the military, with the military guys on the other side. So what really happened is that we were getting arrested every time we were getting in and trying to get out in this, in this, in this huge colossal kind of um, bridge. So it was impossible. It was super frustrating because we were really tight. We only had 15 minutes of light. Everything was like bonkers. Uh, the car grip and everything. So, so yeah, I mean, it was a bit, uh, a bit crazy, the whole thing. Um, to plan out, but the shield itself is to be well prepared, to have like a really specific discourse that you can really kind of get around with, but also get acquainted to the fact that you cannot control the result of certain things. And once you get acquainted with that, you will be able to improvise and use your intelligence in order to resolve and be faster thinking about things. You need to be faster, simply really fast, that's it. Mon? Yes. So uh, there's a question from Don Bates again, uh, Alvaro. Um, I'm just going to read it yeah. to you. Um, okay. So in Australia, we are further east than the Far East, and yet we are really firmly in the West. As such, our view of the world is almost always refracted by uh, Washington, London, Paris, and Berlin. Our news of Venezuela is neither sympathetic nor overly informed, but certainly very concerning. How do you operate there in the current circumstance? And is, is it necessary condition for your work or a necessary place to be and your work takes place there irrespective to the situation? For example, would you leave Venezuela if you could, or do you stay as it propels and defines your work? Well, I mean, I think this film 
I think I, I, I've been trying to look for this film all of my life, um, to be honest. The situation in Venezuela, it's really, it's extremely complex, extremely complex. Um, because it's a, it's, a, it's a key geopolitical strategic point, not only in resources, because petrol still mo moves the world. I mean, don't, still moves the world because all the, all the maritime trade you have is moved through petrol. But um, I wanted to capture, I mean, if you ask, for example, if I had to go to Venezuela in order to do this film, I would say yes, uh, 100%. I mean, I'm a, I'm a strong believer that this, with CGI, it cannot be done. Uh, one, because you can see, I mean, even like a key example, we go, we go, we go, and we go into, into Venezuela, for example, and this is what you see. What do you see? You see pixels, no? You see blurriness, and you see everything that is flat and also removed. So in a way, like for me, I think the context itself, it, it was, was going to be um, informing the film itself um, and telling the story itself. If I didn't have the, that ambience, and if I didn't have that kind of level of, um, of intensity within the shots, within the textures, and even within the way uh, the, the characters moved in a space with urgency and uh, with a certain type of intensity. And also if I couldn't have captured, for me, the most beautiful shot that I ever captured, which was the Amoy refinery in the morning where all the birds were waking up. I didn't even know we were going to have a thousand million birds flying in front of us while a 30 meter flame was like shining on top of the whole town, not letting it be night. No, those things are magic. A cinema is about magic. I, at least a cinema I want to do is about magic. Of course, I mean, I don't, I don't have a, a death wish and I don't have this kind of desire, like, uh, you know, I'm not a war correspondent. I don't like danger per se. I mean, I don't really have that. I'm not like a really courageous person either, but I needed, I needed the essence of, um, not only of conflict itself, but I needed the faces. I needed the, the, the way the facades look, the way the, 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 the petrol stations actually look. And these things, we were so removed and it's, everything is so hermetic, even though I was like, like leaving an hour and a half by, or two hours by plane from it, like you don't really see anything because it's a hermetic closed off tropical uh, environment that you don't really see anything at all. So um, I could have never done that without even learning who I am within the context because I learned more about myself than I could ever believe. Because when you go into the context, you adapt to it you don't really overtake over it. And that's a thing the West really needs to, for me, the Western gaze needs to take on board on the fact that sometimes it's not about bulldozing over things or, or like moralizing things into black and white. Sometimes it's about letting things kind of permeate within you and also kind of understanding your role into them. So I understood my role and I really assumed that role and also assumed assume the consequences of my role. My own, con my own, my main concern was that the whole team was safe and nothing happened to them. I wanted to keep them. I mean, if I have to go, I go. But if they need to be safe, that was my main thing. And Venezuela, I mean, the, the, the layers of complexity, they were so high that when I was trying to write everything from the outside and researching everything from the outside, and when I was going on site, it just meant nothing. Everything I've done, it was like thrown in the garbage and we had to start from point zero all over again. So, yeah. It's almost like understanding a site, right, Alvaro? It is, yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. And, and how important it is to go there yourself to actually understand it. And it's also ties in quite nicely with what we were talking about with Antoine yesterday in terms of this idea of panning through information, but actually going there. And I think that duality is what we're slipping through these days because there's so many different ways that people practice now through this pantopia way of doing it or actually on site. And I guess none is wrong or right. It's just a different approach. And I think these stories and ways that we're telling these, these places is actually quite interesting. Yeah. yeah, but again, like if you want to deal, sorry for the, if you want to deal with a place or with places um, that we might consider exotic, but they have nothing exotic about them, to be honest, mm. there are consequences. For me, 
But it's this not exotic like to them, I'm... right? It's it's exotic. Oh to no, us no, but to us, to being... us, I mean, the, this exotism. For me, exotism is about going to a zoo and seeing a caged animal that is exotic, a tiger, no? But exotism quickly fades out, or going to a backpacker mode hotel in the in the in the Caribbean where you are, where you can surf and where they serve you kind of really fresh mangoes, no? But um, this place that you have a there's a consequence to what you do, always. And you need to assume that there's a consequence to what you do. And that's the way you need to start looking at something. And also, if you're willing to sacrifice and to put yourself forward against that consequence. And it's no joke. It's no joke. Like, mm. Because uh, also not only, not only in terms of safety, you know, also uh, in terms of the images you do. There's a consequence mm. to them. Yeah. There's also like a yeah. gaze to them. You have a responsibility to be able to tell something or to transmit something that is not a reduction. So it's really hard. It's, for me, I have a problem with it still. I, I have like a lot of issues with it still, with my own work, so. Uh, yeah, I think it froze more. I think Mon has frozen. Well, yeah. um, I think, um, We'll, go, we'll take one more question and then um, we'll just wait for Mon to come back. Um, so we've got a question here about what does limbo mean to you and why is it important to you and what does it represent through your lens? Yeah. I mean, first of all, beyond everything, um, I wanted to tell a story about landlessness, uh, about the notion that um, I, I really love the, the idea of that traitor. No? Jean Genet used to say, about, actually Sartre used to say about Jean Genet, that um, treason is the, the worst of crimes because it's, it's what kind of um, sublimates you towards total liberty. No? Um, so based on that, I really wanted to make a film about traitors, about, um, about like pirates, about pilgrims, about people that live on the edge, that live on the border, that live on the limit, not only of identity, but also of geographical kind of points, like really hard geographical points. What I wanted to do, I mean, the concept of the magic hour no, for this, which sometimes is overused, um, for us it was something that it was uh, a no-brainer because, one, we didn't have enough money to buy hard drives. I mean, now you think back in the 2000s, yeah, making digital films was cheap, but now making digital films is super expensive because one frame of this film was 12 megabytes, one frame. So imagine, I start counting. Um, so the idea, um, was to also have a, a format that it would be limiting. It's as if we were shooting in celluloid, so we would only have this amount of time, so we didn't need to have like 100 or 200 ter and terabytes of hard drive, which we didn't have. But also was a way of creating a day of suspension. We, I wanted to mimic a little bit the way I was reading the political situation in Venezuela, which was uh, at standstill, which was like in a completely... Um, limbo again limbo type of situation where nothing happened everything could happen <clears throat> but time seemed to not pass no also i wanted to explore the condition of my subjects of the characters that live in this kind of uh, everlasting twilight it's like a twilight zone that darkness doesn't come or light doesn't come so they're like living in between in between two lands or two states of mind no and also there's a beautiful idea apart from the of course the other you i mean the classic thing if you don't have no shadows over an object. Shadows mean time. It's the Egyptians. I mean, it's, the sun means shadows. Shadows mean time. Time means a passing, a logical passing of, of time. Cinema is about sculpting time, no? So I wanted also to, to kind of, that sculpt, a sculpture to kind of um, fade out and be much more, um, more shapeless, no? Be more shapeless in that sense. So apart from that, <clears throat> Also, there's a really beautiful effect that happens once you have that with the lenses we use, because we, we chose to use, um, I don't know if you see, I'm going to go to the beginning of this. We chose to use two really specific lenses that I had been looking for over five years um, on the market, which are really old, a 1961 Kinoptic 9.8 um, millimeter lens. I think maybe it shows if it, if it wants to show. Yeah, yeah right here. So, uh, la, 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 la. Yeah, right. so yeah, so this is a 9.8 um, Kinoptic, uh, yeah, 9.8 millimeter lens. So it's a, a 1961, it's the first wide angle to really work. And this film 
So Cuba was shot with this lens exactly, you know? So I wanted to make a homage for that. But the way they capture those two lenses, they capture light and they capture the borders or the little limits of volumes when they're hit by light or something. They have a little bit of a violet kind of glow. So they're not sharp, not like a digital lens. So I wanted the volumes to fade, actually to fade as if it's an esfumato, no esfumato type like in the Da Vinci paint, the Raphael paint, the esfumato type onto the background. So I wanted to foreground the background, the bodies to kind of start fading and decomposing into, into the actual whole thing. And with the magic hour, you can really, really do that because you can expose both the foreground and the background on the same level. So that was technically, it was nice. Thank you, Avro. I think we'll, we'll, keep, we'll wrap up here. Mon, are you back with us? Yes. He's still having trouble, just the audio. We can't hear you. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, we can hear you now. There we go. There we go. Sorry. Yeah, my Zoom just crashed. Everyone on the final on the final night, my Zoom crashed. Um, <laughs> um, are we wrapping up, Paul? Yes. Perfect. Um, so, th Alvaro, thank you so much for giving us that that tour of behind the scenes of your work, and I'm very excited to see it um, when it comes out. Um, the way that you portray the emergency and the immediacy of your work and the process that you've dialed, delved in um, and showing behind the scenes. Uh, I think it was a very enjoyable yet open um, experience uh, for all of us. Uh, and uh, it's been the third time that I've seen you lecture in this uh, thing. And every, each year I feel it builds on, on top of each other. And I think the conversations itself actually gets clearer in terms of the atmospheres, the experiences, the lighting, the angles that you're building. And I think it's an ongoing journey. As I said, it's this, uh, I guess, ongoing journey that you see yourself like pursuing as well, where you make and break your own scripts in your own films and your own images. I think in terms of the six part lecture series, I, I quite liked all the different variations and different modes that we've seen it in. Uh, I guess from the insights of how to fail the industry from Tiger Tiger to the future of storytelling within the trust of technology by Nathan at Infer uh, to even you know, music being made by a Game Boy. Uh, in, in today's age to the value of the virtual uh, from Lara and Frederick panning through information, which is the exact opposite of what you've done. And I guess at the end, it's the power of the image and the agency you have as a person, <laughs> I guess, navigating through this media jungle that I think we're all, I guess, trying to look for and find meaning. So in that, I would say thanks. And I'm thankful, I thank you everyone who also participated throughout this six pack lecture series as well and allowing Paul and I for um, doing this. I also want to thank Paul for being able to be so versatile and uh, orchestrating this with me. Uh, and also behind the scenes, um, Jet Baker uh, from MSD, uh, Philippa, uh, as well as James, putting everything together. Uh, and also want to thank Donald Bates uh, for this opportunity uh, from MSD on my end. Yes. Thank you, Mon. Thank you for hosting this six-part epic series with me. And thank you, Alvaro Fernandez, for your um, amazing, awful ethnographical kind of narrative tonight, um, which is almost as epic as the uh, film itself. So we do look forward to watching it. So once it came out, I'm sure there will be a lot of fans coming from Melbourne. So tonight, we learned about how image can be weaponized, and we will now close the six, um, the last of the six um, lectures from the Visiting School Melbourne. Um, we will hopefully we'll be back again next year. Uh, we're gonna have um, a final review this coming Friday with all the students uh, with the work and then we will have an exhibitions and online platforms showcasing all the works that will be launched on the 31st of July. Uh, more information of that will be coming through to the MSD events channel. Um, so tomorrow night we will celebrate the end of semester uh, exhibitions so or the students work the virtual MSDX winter 2020 will happen tomorrow night the launch will be at 6 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time so I'd like to thank everybody again like Mon I'd like to thank all the production team behind the MSDX for allowing us to take this six part series and we hope you can join us for the MSDX event tomorrow night tonight <laughs>